Well, I am Sashank Sekhar from Ranchi, Jharkhand. I am doing my engineering from Satyavan Engineering College here. Sir, your lecture, after hearing your lecture, our misbelief about Islam and Muslims vanished today. <laughs> Sir, I have been to Jammu and Kashmir and have seen the trauma and pain that the people are suffering there because of the so-called jihad of some Muslims. Sir, my question is, that does Islam support such activities? If no, then what actually the word jihad means? Is it in accordance with the 56th verse of the 7th chapter of Quran, which says, do not mischief? Or the 40th verse of 42nd chapter, which says, forgiveness is better than retaliation? Or the 32nd verse of the 5th chapter, which states, if anyone killed a person, he kills the mankind. Sir, I have one more question in the same context. And it is, that does Islam teaches to give priority to the religion that is dharma or majhab before the country or motherland that is Matri Bhumi or Kaum? Thanks a lot. The brother has asked you very good questions. The first question is regarding concept of jihad. He says that why are people fighting? He has been to Kashmir about jihad. Does Islam encourage this fighting? What is the meaning of jihad? Does it not disagree with the quotations he gave us? Remind the chapter 5 or 32. Brother, as far as the word jihad is concerned, there is a misconception not only amongst the non-Muslims, but even among the Muslims. What most of the people think that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for his personal gain, whether it be for politics, whether it be for language, whether it be for color, it is called as jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim. Jihad comes from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle, like how we have jiddo jihad. So jihad basically means to strive to struggle. And in the Islamic context, it means to strive against one's own evil inclination. It also means to strive to make the society better. It even includes to strive in the battlefield to fight in self-defense. Jihad also means to fight against operation and tyranny. Jihad basically means to strive or struggle. Many people have misconception that jihad means holy war. And many people translate jihad as holy war. The Arabic word for holy war is harbu muqaddasa. If you read the Quran, nowhere in the Quran, not a single verse, nowhere in the authentic hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is this word harbu muqaddasa mentioned anywhere. There is no harbu muqaddasa at all. The translation of jihad is not holy war at all. This word holy war was first used by the historians to describe the crusades of the Christian who spread Christianity and who killed thousands of people in the name of Christianity. Unfortunately, today, many people, including so-called Muslim scholars, inverted commas, they translate jihad as holy war. It's a mistranslation. Yes, jihad means to strive, to struggle. One of the striving can include fighting. Fighting also should be in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is kital fi sabilillah. Now, regarding a question, that why does Islam encourage fighting and killing and there are many critics of Islam who normally say, Islam is a ruthless religion. It always says that we should kill the non-Muslim wherever we find them. Many critics, including the critic of India, Arun Shuri, and he writes in his book, The World of Fatwa, he quotes Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5, and says that the Quran says, wherever you find a kafir, into bracket Hindu, that you kill them. And if you open the Quran, Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 5, and if you read, it does say, wherever you find a kafir, you kill. But this is a quotation out of context. For the context, if you read the first few verses, it speaks about a peace treaty between the mushriks of Makkah and the Muslims. If you read Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, first few verses, it speaks about a peace treaty between the Muslims and the mushriks of Makkah. Now, this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the mushriks of Makkah. By the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 5, he gives them an ultimatum to the mushriks and he tells them, put things straight in four months' time, otherwise a declaration of war. And in the battlefield, Allah says that when the enemies come to attack you, you kill the enemies. So this verse is revealed in the battlefield, that when the enemies come to kill you, don't get scared, fight them. But naturally, any army general today, to boost up the morale of his soldiers, he will say that when the enemies come, kill them. He will not say that, just be quiet. And Arun Shuri, after quoting verse number 5, he jumps to verse number 7. Because verse number 6 has the reply. Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse number 6 says that if the kafir, if the enemy seek asylum, if they want peace, don't just give it to them. Escort them to a place of security. 
if the enemy wants peace or asylum, escort them to a place of security. Today, the most merciful army general, maximum intelligence soldiers, that let the enemy go. Here Allah says, don't just let them go, escort them to a place of security. So whenever these verses are there of killing, including the verse of Surah Anfal, chapter 8, verse number 60, when they say that, prepare your steed and be prepared, attack the enemy. The next verse says, but if the enemy is inclined towards peace, you give it to them. So almost all the verses we talk about fighting, after that it says that if they want peace, peace is better. Now regarding your question, what about the verses of Surah Maida chapter 5 verse 32, Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 40, that if anyone kills any human being, it's as though he has killed the whole of humanity. This is the basic rule of Islam, that if anyone kills any human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for creating mischief in the land, spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves any human being, it is as though he has saved the whole of humanity. Now if you read, if you read Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita chapter number 2 verse number 50, it says, Krishna, Shri Krishna tells Arjun to do jihad, strive. If you read Mahabharat, Mahabharat talks about thousands of verses of fighting, thousands of verses, many number of times more than what the Quran speaks. Mahabharat is a scripture, as you may be aware, it talks about a feud, a fight between the Pandavas and the Kauravas. The five brothers Pandavas and hundred brothers Kauravas fight. And Bhagavad Gita is a part of Mahabharata, 18 chapters in which Sri Krishna, Lord, he gives advice to Arjun. Arjun says, Arjun says in Bhagavad Gita chapter number 1, verse 42 to 46, that I would prefer getting killed unarmed rather than fighting my cousins. How can I fight my cousins? The Kauravas, my cousins. I would prefer getting killed unarmed rather than fight. Immediately, Lord Krishna. You know what does he say in chapter number 2? Verse number 2 and 3 says that how could such impure thought come in your mind? It is sinful. How could you become so important? How could your heart become so weak? So Lord Krishna says such thoughts are important. They are impure. They are sinful. It will prevent you from going to the heavenly planets, going to Jannah. After that, Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 2, verse number 31, 33 says, He says, Lord Krishna, He says to Arjun that it is the duty of a Kshatriya to fight. If he does not fight, he shall not go to heaven. And if you do not fight, you are doing a sin. So if you analyze in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that you have to fight. Imagine if I take verses of Bhagavad Gita and say that Lord Krishna tells Arjun that you have to kill your relatives. If I quote out of context, it will be devilish. But in context, it is Lord Krishna says that if you have to fight against falsehood, for the truth, you can fight against anyone, even if it be your relatives. So now in context, it makes sense that if you have to fight for justice, even if it be against your relatives, there's no problem. So that is the message of Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharat, fighting truth against falsehood. The moment I tell a Hindu about Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita, he has the knowledge. He says, no, but Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita is a fight between truth and falsehood. That is the same thing what is mentioned in the Quran. So moment I quote to you Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharata, you understand the Quran better. And furthermore, many people say, oh, this Quran talking about jihadis. If you do jihad, if you die, you go to Jannah. Many critics, including Arun Shuri quote, and they quote the, even Hadith of Sai Bukhari, volume number four, in the book of Jihad, chapter number two, Hadith 46. It says that a mujahid is a person who strives in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah alone knows who strives. And further, a prophet said that if a mujahid dies in the battlefield, he shall go to Jannah, he will get paradise. But if he returns back, if he does not die, he will return back with the booty of war. This hadith and several verses of the Quran are quoted by the critics of Islam. I wonder how could the Hindu critics quote these things? Haven't they read the Bhagavad Gita? Haven't they read the Mahabharat? Even Shri Krishna, he mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 2, verse number 37. O Arjun, O son of Kunti, rise up and fight. Even if you're killed, no problem, you will go to heaven. And if you return back successfully, you will get the good riches of this earthly world. Same thing as the Hadith. So when Krishna says to Arjun that fight, if you're killed, no problem, you will go to heaven. If you return back successful, you will get the riches of the world. That is the same thing what Sai Bukhari says, what the Quran says. So therefore, you should understand each other better by reading the scripture. So Islam allows fighting as a last resort in self-defense or to fight against oppression, otherwise no. And jihad means to strive to struggle.
Now coming to your second question. Which is more important? Which is more important following the rules of the country or following the mazhab, the deen? It is like you asking me, who do I belong to first? Do I belong to my father or my mother first? <laughs> Brother, as far as following the rules of the country and following the rules of deen, Almighty God is concerned, Almighty God is our creator. He is more superior to us. Following the rules of deen is more important for us than any other rule laid down by father, mother, <laughs> or any country. But, but, I am an Indian. I know there's not a single law in the Indian constitution which prevents any Muslim in India to follow Islam. In fact, India is one of the few countries which is mentioned in the constitution that it is the right, it's the birthright of every citizen of India to preach, practice his religion. That's what I'm doing. There is not a single law in India which prevents me from doing something which is first or compels me for doing something which is haram. There is no law. I can offer five times a law if I want. If I don't want, I can't offer. There is not a single law in the Indian constitution which prevents me from becoming a good Muslim. Therefore, as far as I am concerned, I am a very practicing Muslim, alhamdulillah, and also practicing Indian. And if by definition, by geographical definition, an Indian geographically is called Hindu. So if Hindu means a geographical definition, I am a Hindu living in India, and I am a practicing Muslim.